Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, it's Wednesday, so it's another midweek mini mail call. A little bit of a hodgepodge of things today, but I think some of them you'll find interesting. So without further ado, let's get right to it. We have a package here. This one comes from JP in Peoria, Arizona. Hi to all my Arizona viewers. Okay, we have a note which I accidentally just ripped because the way the tape was connected. We'll take a look at that in a second. It says readme.txt on it. I'll move this big box on the floor and we will take stuff out of that. Let's check out the readme.txt. JP writes, greetings from Phoenix, Arizona. I hope this package has safely made its way to your basement. Absolutely it did, perfect condition, great packing. I've been a fan of your channel for almost two years after YouTube recommended me your video on the Trash Pick LCD TV. Yeah, just a little update on that TV. I guess it was two years ago when I found that TV in the trash. That thing still works, it still works great. I had it at my office and I would use it periodically during the day if I wanted to watch the news or whatever. Unfortunately, our office has closed uh, due to the pandemic. So I actually have that TV at home now and it's in storage because I don't really have anywhere to use it, but hopefully I'll get an office again soon and then I will be able to bring that TV back and use it. it still works great. It had that little crack in the corner, little blob, it sort of went away and now it just looks like a hair that's lying on top of the screen. Otherwise that thing works great. JP goes on to say, he really appreciated my explanation of how I repaired the backlight and proceeded to binge watch most of the rest of your videos on your channel. I've always been fascinated with watching people repair older technology back when components could actually be fixed, as well as just seeing what is inside electronics and how they operate. I hardly have any retro computers to call my own, but hope to grow my collection as time goes on. Ever since discovering your channel, I've eagerly awaited Saturdays and more recently Wednesdays too, when new videos come out. That's awesome. Thanks, thanks JP. As for this is somewhat a large parcel, I've included a few items from the local electronics recycler in the Phoenix area. I have a buddy who works there and was recently alerted to a bunch of older equipment came in from a large company in the area that closed its stores recently. They could not disclose the company name and I could not find any property tags while browsing through the containers of components. However, a lot of the equipment seemed to be related to older telecom systems. I picked out a few things that caught my eye the most. As a result, the assortment may be a bit random. I do not have the means for testing most of the included items, so I hope they work or are able to be used. If not, they can always look cool on a shelf. I took inspiration from a previous mail call video and built a protective styrofoam shell inside the box. That would be Stuart's packing job, first seen on the Apple II Plus video and since seen on some other stuff. Nothing super fancy, just bracing on the walls to keep the content safe. All right, and then he lists what he found. So we'll, we'll go through what's in the box and I'll refer to the list in case there's anything that I am unsure what it is. I hope you and your family remain safe during the ongoing human malware situation. Thank you, JP. Thanks very much, JP, very nice letter. I'll keep your packing list ready. So as I go through the items in the box, I'll be able to refer to the packing list. Okay, let's see what the first item is. Appears to be a keyboard of some kind. Ooh, check that out. A rather nice chunky keyboard. It says Digital Electronics Corporation on the back and the rubber feet are disintegrating. So I'm not quite sure, I guess, I need to be careful when I put this down because sometimes those rubber feet, they're so gooey that it leaves gooey things all over the place. I once put something down on my couch. It was like a old computer, maybe an Apple IIc and the little white feet were turning to goo. And I put it down on the cushion and only sat there for maybe an hour and I went to move it. And there's now like permanent rubber goo material like in the fabric. And I tried to get it out and I couldn't. Oh, all right, here's something called the RAM check in a little carrying case. JP writes, now you have a pet that loves sticks of memory. That would be Rammy. <laughs> you need to have the tools to give Rammy routine checkups like any other pet. <laughs> Although I could not find any connectors to interface directly to Rammy, there are a few swappable disks included with the RAM check device. This allows you to quickly slot a stick of RAM, test it with a push of a button, 
The unit I'm sending you seems to support SD RAM, DDR, DDR2 RAM. I included a few sticks of DDR2 and DDR RAM for you to check out its functions. But there it is. That's kind of fascinating looking. Yeah, it's uh, got some modules and stuff, a whole bunch of different modules in here. All right, this is next, wrapped up in bubble wrap. Let me get the knife out, so cut this away. All right, let's see, what, what is this? this? These look like um, maybe cache memory module terminators. Like if you don't have a cache memory module in your Pentium motherboard, maybe these were designed to go into the motherboard to terminate that part of the bus, I'm not quite sure. Okay, actually JP writes, these are Intel CPU terminators, at least I think they are, AGP profile terminators. Uh, these probably were for use in a multi-slot one system. So I think Pentium 2s came on the slot one cards. And if you had a dual motherboard that took two, you needed to put one of these in to terminate the bus so you didn't just leave that connector open. I have a feeling that's what this is. It looks like it's just got resistor packs on it and some capacitor. So if anyone's exactly familiar with those, please let me know. Yeah, all right, we have a, a network card of some kind. And lastly, we have this, another half of one of these um, balls here. Oh, oh, I see, awesome, he was protecting the pins. What is this, what is this? This is some Intel thing. Intel 386 breakout board. I couldn't find much online about this, but it looks to be a breakout board. You pop this into the socket and there's a processor here and then it has all of the pins broken out so you can clip on test leads. And lastly, there is a CPU here and it looks like an Intel 3D6 CPU of some kind. It's got this heatsink glued on top of it, just like this one does. In fact, now that I look at this, this actually looks like it has a socket on here. So these are socket pins. So this CPU most likely comes off and maybe these are two different speed CPUs. All right, cool, that's it. There's just a power cord left in the box. JP, thank you for sending this stuff in. It'll be very interesting to take a closer look at some of these things, especially stuff like this breakout board and of course that RAM tester. So let's take a closer look at this stuff on the bench. So check out this keyboard that JP sent. I mean, it's just so big and chunky. Doesn't feel amazing to type on actually, but look when I flip this up. Look at the feet that are on the bottom of this thing. One is missing down here, but like they're almost, I don't know, two centimeters high, plus already the ridiculous height of this entire keyboard. So when it sits on your desk, your wrists are like this at this extreme angle trying to type on this thing. Now with of course those one of the feet missing, it's very wobbly, but I'm curious to see what we see underneath here. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that these are stack pull switches. So we should see a box with like a little metal contact in the middle. It kind of feels like those, but we'll see. Yep, that's what these are. I'm pretty sure this is called a stack pull, although I might be wrong on the exact name. But if you look inside there, there is this white thing here and in there, there are the two metal contacts. And as this white part slides down, the two metal contacts in there actually touch each other. And that's what's making the contact of the switch. So it's absolutely a mechanical switch. It's not something like rubber dome, but it has a linear actuation and it just doesn't feel that good in my opinion. Now let's talk about the keyboard itself. This is the VT102 keyboard. I think that's the terminal this came from, Digital Electronics Corporation. The layout is relatively standardized. Pretty much everyone is used to the layout that came from the Model M keyboard these days. And this is actually pretty close to that. But really typing on this full time, if you had to go to this from a modern keyboard, you'd be pretty, pretty quick to adapt to it, other than the feel and the height. The height is just crazy. Put it this way, I just took this ruler and stuck it next to the key here. And the, the nine key is about eight centimeters from my desk surface. That's really tall. That's about three inches high. From an interface perspective, we have a three pin TRS jack here. So tip, ring, and sleeve. I think that's what that stands for. So this would be some type of a serial link. Most certainly this is like a two way communication link because I wouldn't be surprised if we see a speaker underneath here. And yes, there's actually a speaker installed in here, which probably can be beeped from the computer. So that indicates that this is a two way 
bi-directional link. It's a bit hard to see, but there are also some LEDs that are behind this little plastic panel here. Online, local, keyboard locked, and L1 through 4. So uh, certainly those could be set up from the computer side, while well, the terminal in this case, and lit and changed as needed. And we have digital part number 70-14653-00, REV-M. Made in Hong Kong, there's a couple stickers here, HK, HK, there's an 87 and another 87 and another 87. So maybe this was made in 1987. I do have to say that I think 1987 seems a little late for this keyboard. I can't imagine this was being sold in 87. I think the terminals in the 80s, or maybe I'm wrong, maybe the 220 terminal, when did the 220 come out? I'm no expert in digital stuff. I'm just gonna take the screws out here We'll just take a quick look on the inside. Oh, there are massive dust bunnies in here. Hello, dust bunnies. But there it is, we have a date code. 15th of September, 1983. Most of these don't seem to have date codes on them, although this one says 83 and this one says 83. And the main keyboard controller says 1983, 18th week. I think I'm just gonna suck up these dust bunnies into my little vacuum cleaner here. So there might already be good documentation on the interface of this keyboard, but if you know of anything that's out there, like perhaps someone has already made an adapter with an Arduino that goes to PS2, please let me know in the description below. I haven't done any research, so I haven't actually looked yet but it would be pretty cool to at least try this thing out on a PC. All right, so JP also sent along this cool any 1000 or any, I'm sorry, any 2000 network card. On the option ROM, it says Microdyne with McAfee ROM shield. What exactly does that mean? But yes, as I think I mentioned before, we have coax, AUI, and a 10 base T ethernet connection on there, so very handy. And what's really cool about the NE2000 standard, so there it says NE2000 plus, these were standardized by Novell. And essentially, I, I'm pretty sure this is how this works, but all NE2000 cards are compatible with each other. Meaning, if you have an NE2000 card and you don't have the drivers for this specific card, like the main chip on here says Eagle by Microdyne, it doesn't matter. You just find the NE2000 drivers and that should actually work. So in Windows, in Linux, things like that, it should just work. And the same goes for any 1000 cards, the 8-bit version of these. There will be people who know way more about all that any 1000, any 2000 stuff, including N Commander, who has a bunch of videos on Novell. And if you haven't seen his channel, I recommend you check it out. But you can always ask him in a comment or on Twitter if you have questions about these types of cards, and I surely will be asking him. So I did a quick Google here, and here's an article on the NE1000 right here. The NE1000 and 2000 is an early line of low-cost Ethernet cards originally produced by Novell. Its popularity had a significant impact on the pervasiveness of networking. And they are based on an early national semiconductor prototype. And I think I have an NE1000 card around that has the national semiconductor 8390 chip on it. And here it talks about the NE2000. It's a 16-bit version that followed in 1988. And here we go, companies were able to make cards without royalties to be compatible, and they just had to submit their cards to Novell for certification, which would just check that whether the drivers would work or not, the standard drivers. And it does appear that Windows 2000 was the last version of Windows that's fully supported the NE2000, and of course you could find stuff for DOS, but definitely newer OSs don't work. So these are definitely a good retro option for networking, as there are DOS drivers that do support these any 1000 and 2000 carts and here we have the next cool thing that jp sent which are some test things for i guess 86 dx development so this thing here it would plug into the motherboard into the dx socket the chip is right there in a sort of a pass-through socket and then you have all of these pins which have all of the signals available for you to clip on test probes very easily of course, this thing doesn't have a huge amount of use for a normal retro computer enthusiast, but I suppose if I were trying to troubleshoot some specific problems on a 386 motherboard and I needed to tie into any of the specific pins on the 386, obviously 
this would be very useful. Now there are two different 3D6s here that he included, and these both have these sort of mushroom heat sinks on them. These are not handles, they are heat sinks. They are epoxied on there, so they will not come off not, not easily. They weren't super common in the PC world, but I think like Sun Microsystems machines, you would have seen these very frequently on those older machines. I'm gonna try to get this processor off of here. So we can try to figure out what speed these are. I assume they're just gonna be slow speeds. I really could use one of those like chip lifters for these types of sockets. Uh, CPU Galaxy, another great channel that I watch, he has shown the, that off. It's like a special lifting thing that goes in between the pins and lifts the, the chip right out of the PLCC socket. Or it's not PLCC, is it? Oh no, it is PLCC, that's right. Anyhow, there we go, I got it free. Look at that, beautiful gold, gold pins and sockets there. Made in USA by Intel. And looking closely, we have data starting at 31. So that's, that's the 32 bits. So there's zero through 31. And then here we have address lines. We have two through nine, 10 through 17, 18, 25, 26 to 31. Yes, there are 32 address lines. I think there are two more that must be somewhere else on this board. Hmm, interesting, I don't actually see address lines zero and one. But maybe there's a reason for that. There's a part number here, PB166559-001. That is in the actual mat that is in the copper there on this board. And this must be a serial number, I suppose, N00142384, which you probably can't read due to the glare. <laughs> All right, so we have these two 3D6 processors here. Let me see if I can look up these part numbers down here. And the reason why I have to do that is because most of the markings are completely covered up by the epoxied heatsink. So for this chip right here, the one that has the larger die or whatever cap on the bottom, I can make out on here it says SZ566. And I found here SZ566 and it's associated with the Intel 82380-25. This is actually not a processor, but a 32-bit DMA controller that was used on early 3D6 motherboards. This would have been later integrated into the chipset on clone motherboards, but the early ones definitely had a separate Intel chip that looked a lot like a 3D6. So unfortunately, I don't think this is even a processor at all. And then on this other processor here, you can see that it's pretty much definitely an Intel 3D6. It has the I there. And I can just make out that it says SX541 on it. And that's the one with the smaller pad there. And here I did a Google and yes, Intel 3D6, 16 megahertz. And it says that SX541. So I'm gonna write on here that this is an 8386 and I'm gonna put 16 megahertz. And this other one here is an 82380. All right, so there we go. So I'm glad I, I know at least, and I'm not sure what would have happened if I had plugged this into a motherboard as a processor, it might've caused an issue. And finally, we have the RAM check. Rammy fully approves of this thing. So if we open this thing up, look at this, this is pretty neat. As I had mentioned in the unboxing, it's a shame that I don't have the adapters for, say, regular 30-pin SIMs and 72-pin SIMs, because I have a lot of those, and I would really love to do the testing on those things. Oh, there's actually a CD and some software here. So the RAM Check Advanced Memory Tester by, by Innoventions Incorporated. Ooh, okay. We have module power, we have a burst light there, little LCD screen, some buttons to control things. Looks like here, I'd say that this is probably an SDRAM socket that's built into the tester. And then right here we have a DDR 184 pin adapter. Here is a DIMM adapter for memory modules for a laptop. It's unfortunately missing one of the clips. That probably won't affect it too badly. And then we have one more adapter here. And these connect, as you can see, with these um, multi-pin connections into the adapter, into the module, I think. A DDR2 tester. And then what do we have here? I think these are adapters that go from like this. And it does. Uh, so this goes, I think, from DDR1 to a laptop DDR1 module. 
This is a DDR2SO DIM adapter, so that would be for this one. So these are mostly passive, of course. Looks like it's from around 2005, that report. Let's see what this one says. The DDR2 SO DIM converter. So that's one of these here. It's uh, this one right here. This requires firmware 2.31 or higher. Please check with their website where to download the latest firmware. And the last one here is the 240 pin DDR RAM adapter. So that is this one right here, this entire module. And of course you need some firmware 2.29 or higher. No idea if these guys are still around online. And we have some software here, installation and manual. Pull off this adapter, there we go. Came right off. When we take a look at this tester without the adapters plugged in, we just have the RAM socket there for the SD RAM. So let's power this up. I have some SD RAM to test with. I don't think any of this memory here is SD RAM, it is not, but I have some handy. I will grab that. First, we'll plug in the power here, on off. The RAM check. All right, firmware 2.35 said right on there. I went into Rammy's little home and I found a bunch of RAM. This is all SD RAM in this bag here. Let's just give a couple quick tests of some SD RAM. It's actually funny because I was trying to get a computer working the other day that used SD RAM and I had to keep trying different SIMs before the computer was stable. And I was, didn't know if it was a problem with the motherboard or the memory, but with this tester, I can actually just figure that out. So we have some Micron PC100. I don't know the capacity. So let's just pop this baby in here. There it is, I stuck it in there. It's, it's in there, it doesn't really hold onto it super tightly, but it doesn't need to, it's just there for testing. And I'll push the button and see what happens. Ram check. From 1987 to 2008. Okay, start basic test, F1. Here it is. It says 100 megahertz SD RAM. And we have all checks, basic test okay. <laughs> this thing is cool. It shows the specific, 75 megahertz page burst. Talks about the nanoseconds. Obviously, I think there's a, like a EEPROM or something on these things that can, it can read that stuff out, but SD RAM unbuffered, CL2 at 100 megahertz, ECC no. Okay, actually it's doing extensive test. Voltage cycle. And it's testing different voltages. Oh, this thing is cool. Really cool. And it gave a nice little tone and it says that the extensive test was okay. I think it's already clear, but it did say it was okay. So I guess uh, I need to do a little project where I just go through all this memory and test it out. And I'll just draw little check marks on it to say that it's good. This is really, really handy. I'm looking at the RAM check online and this is definitely the tester here. And it talks about that, yes, it can test with the right adapters, DDR, DDR2, and even DDR3. Support for registered, unbuffered, ECC, and non-ECC parity DIMMs. If we keep scrolling through the article here, there's obviously some kind of Windows interface. Looks like Windows XP is probably over the serial connection, which was included with it. But if we read down here, RAM check is fully automatic and user-friendly. Anyone can use it with ease, definitely. It has a graphical LCD, zero insertion, force, and removal, add-on adapters for 144 DIMMs or 30 and 72 pin. So I really need to find those because I have so much of that RAM and it, it really actually, I, more than once I've gone to use some of the memory that I have that was sent in to RAMI and the chip was bad and it actually caused a lot of heartache because I wasn't sure if it was an issue with the RAM or the computer because I was testing on an old machine. So really, ideally, I need to go through all that memory that's been sent in to Rami and throw away or e-waste all the memory modules that are bad. And right now, it's just, it's so difficult to test those memory modules, especially because on like the Macintosh, the 30-pin SIMs, they're, they're plastic, the holders, and they're so easy to break. So I don't want to go switching them all out. So a zero insertion force test thing for this would be fantastic. So I'm definitely gonna to need to go look to see if I can find that module or if anyone is aware of where I can get that module, please let me know because that would be incredibly helpful for me here on the channel.
Okay, so I've gone ahead and I've tested all of the SD RAM that I had, the, the full size stuff at least. And I am a bit shocked, but not really all of this is bad. This thing totally rocks. It's really easy to test the memory. So I've marked these all as bad and I save them here so I can show you some of the tests when they fail. I did go through and I tested all of the memory on the quick test and the extensive test. And all of the ones that were bad, I think, except for one failed on the quick test. So I stuck this one in here. I don't even remember what size it is. We're gonna hit start. And let's see what happens. I think this is the one that fails on the extensive test only. Okay, so it's completed the first stage of the testing. 128 megabytes, PC 100. So we're just gonna skip through all this and we're gonna run extensive test and let's see what happens. While this runs, I was looking online for the 30 pin, 72 pin module. It seems to be one module that has both 72 pin and 30 on it. And unfortunately, I found a couple pictures of it, but I couldn't find anyone selling it anymore. eBay, nothing. I, seen, I saw a few people trying to sell this thing on eBay, but it didn't have the 30 pin and the 72 pin module. So yeah, that, that's annoying. It'd be really cool to find those so I could go through and quickly test all the other memory I have and not just this SD RAM here. The fact that all of this memory was bad explains why when I was trying to recently get that Pentium motherboard and I kept struggling with the computer beeping at me when I powered it up and just not generally working. And it was obviously because there was just so much of this that was bad and I didn't realize that so I kept running into problems with that thing. Now it's running a chip heat mode here. So it's heating up the memory module while putting a lot of current into it, I guess. And then I think this one fails at the end of this. I kind of remember when this one failed, what it would say is like, okay, it actually, ran, it actually worked. I don't fully believe that this one is actually working because for sure this was acting up. It was acting weird. And it would say stuff like, it would start testing and then say memory module removed and, or wiring error. So this one here is 32 megs. Uh, what speed is this? I don't know, can't tell. Actually, that's one of the other good things. I had a bunch of this memory. I couldn't even tell what speed it was or, or what capacity. And this thing, of course, tells you exactly what it is. So right away, data error. So these memory modules are 64 bits wide. That means they have 64 bits of data path to them. And this lets you see all of the data bits. So we can scroll through here. So here's the first 16, all checks out. Second 16 bits, that's up to 31 there, zero through 31 is all good. And there it is. That is the failed bit right there. And that's just on the quick test. All the other ones are working fine. So it just has one fail. Let's try that again, F1, here we go. Data bit error. Actually, now there's another failed bit now. 15 is also failing. Anyhow, okay, so this module, bad, right? Let's just pop a different one in and I'll show you another failed module. Data bit error. And this one has uh, bit zero, bit two, four, and six all failed. And this one over here has failed and everything else is working okay. Anyhow, it's, it's pretty consistent. Like these bad modules here, they will fail every time, except for that first one, which is just acting weird. It might have a bad contact on it or something. All these other ones fail really consistently. In fact, this one, let's see, connector wiring error. So I take it that means this has like a short circuit. Maybe one of these caps has shorted or something. Everything looks fine, but it always says connector error, connector wiring error. And here is a PC-133 one. Let's pop this one in, see what we see. There we go. That one ran for quite a lot longer before we had a data bit error. And the bit error there is what it looks like. It's right there. It's bit 31. All the other bits are testing okay. Anyhow, I am so happy to have this thing. JP, thank you very much. Just the fact I was able to eliminate all this bad SD RAM from my collection will make my life so much easier. I mean, there's still, I still have a good amount of good SD RAM. And that's why the 30 pin memory test would be so useful. I have so much of that RAM. And it's really disheartening when I go and grab some and I put it in the computer and it doesn't start and I grab some more, it doesn't start, grab some more, and then it works. So I just need to test it. 
So JP, thank you very much for the keyboard, for this amazing RAM tester, the network card, and the 3D6 processor and breakout board here. Really cool stuff. All right, we have a package here from Adam in Ontario, Canada. Hi to all my Canadian viewers and all my viewers in Ontario specifically. I am sure I have mentioned this plenty of times before. I'm from Montreal originally. I've lived in the US for quite a while now, but I do have family in Ontario, of course, as most Canadians do because it's got Toronto in it, which is one of the biggest cities in Canada. Well, actually it's the biggest city in Canada. We have Boxception here where we have a box inside a box. All right, let's see what this is. It's in a box that says CHI Overhead Doors, Ottawa Garage Door. Right away, I see candy. Okay, we have a note and we have some Canadian candy on here. Macintosh Creamy Toffee. We have some Nestle Truffles mm -hmm. from Nestle Canada. Excellent. Adam writes, enclosed you'll find a ruggedly built Unitech K150 keyboard. Thought you could pair this up with one of your XTAT systems. I believe it has Cherry MX black key switches. It supports a five pin DIN connector. It supposedly doesn't speak AT, but it has an FAT layout. Also enclosed is a McNally Mac keyboard with Apple desktop bus mouse in case you are in need of spares. These may be a dime a dozen for you. The keyboard and mouse I grabbed from an e-waste bin. I only use an IBM Model M, so this is of no use to me. And I'm also including some quintessential Canadian Macintosh toffee for you. The trick to breaking these are to freeze them, slam them on a hard surface <laughs> while still in the packaging and then enjoy. Thank you again for all your hard work, Adam. And he says he's from Almonte, Ontario, which is about 30 kilometers west of Ottawa. So uh, actually the toffee already has kind of broken a little bit. And um, I can tell though, it's pretty hard, let's see. Pretty hard, although uh, actually just, it breaks up even while it's at room temperature in here. Let's see about this one. Oh yeah, that's, <laughs> that is hard. That is, that is hard, but if you break, if you hit it on something, it snaps it. All right, so uh, there's the uh, Apple mouse uncovered. Yeah, these are always useful. I do have several of these, but I have a lot of Macintosh computers. And I don't I don't actually know if I have a one-to-one -one relationship of things like Apple mice and keyboard to Macintoshes. So if I ever wanted to set up all the Macs all at once, say on display at a computer show or something, I'd need a lot of mice. All right, so let's see here. Here's one of the keyboards. Look at this keyboard. This is such a clone of the Apple Extended Keyboard 2 but this is not an Apple Extended Keyboard 2. This is a McNally clone version of it. Okay, this is a Mac ADB keyboard, AKA S-Video cable. You could use an S-Video cable interchangeably. All right, let's move this packing, let's move this packing material. All right, there's the uh, ruggedized keyboard. So when he says ruggedized, it's metal on the back. Definitely feels mechanical. All right, cool. Well, let's move the keyboards away for a second and test out this candy. I can't say I have seen these in the US, but that doesn't mean anything. They, they may well be available here. It's in there, they're like, it's just a box with some individually wrapped little candies in them. And let's try one of these. It just says classic recipe. I assume this is gonna be chocolate with some nuts and some caramel. So it'll be sticky and get all over my teeth. Mm -hmm. Yes, those are absolutely delicious. On the back here, it says Canadian tradition and product of Canada since 1949. I'm sure I've had these before. They taste very familiar and they taste delightful. <laughs> these will not last very long in the house here. It's a combo you just can't go wrong with. It's just amazing. So thank you very much for those. Let's try out this teeth breaking toffee here. Okay, I found a little piece here, a little shard, which I guess what toffee is is Caramel that is hardened, I guess. I'm not I'm not a baker, so I'm not 100% sure, but oops, if you dro I drop this onto my probably dirty bench. It has the color of caramel, and I assume that if you just let it all get hard when you're preparing it or whatever, then it gets like this, but let's give this a try. All right, well, I can tell these are teeth breaking type candy. It's really hard, even the little shards, you can't just crunch down on it. I noticed on the package here, it says smack the Mac. 
which clearly means the concept is you do take it and you smack it down on the table to break it up in little pieces. Toffee tastes like caramel. It's got that kind of uh, yummy burned caramelized sugar taste, which is pretty delicious. I kind of prefer the softer stuff that you like the little cubes. You can pop those in and eat those or Werther's even. You don't chew on those. They just sort of you suck on them. So thank you very much, Adam. Very delightful candy. And let's take a closer look at this stuff on the bench. All right, the two keyboards that Adam sent me, uh, the Turtles candy, which I think I was calling them truffles. I apologize, they were turtles. Those are gone. <laughs> they are long since gone. I've eaten all of those. I opened up the package about a month ago, and yeah, those candies got eaten pretty quickly. So let's take a closer look at the two keyboards that Adam has sent. So this one here is a Macintosh keyboard ADB. It would work on an Apple II GS as well. It is a clone of the Apple Extended Keyboard 2. There are two versions of that keyboard, and this is clearly a clone of the second one. Unfortunately, though, this entire thing is made out of ABS plastic, unlike the Apple keyboard where all the keys, except for the spacebar, are PBT. And that means that this thing has yellowed pretty much evenly. Let's just pop a key cap off and see what's underneath here. I have my key puller here. Bet you this is rubber dome. It certainly feels like it. Oh, it's got some kind of a slider mechanism. So the key cap itself doesn't actuate directly on the rubber domes. It connects to a slider that does, does the actuation. It's definitely a tactile rubber dome under there. Feels okay, actually. I mean, it's not a horrible feeling keyboard. Definitely not up to the level of the Apple keyboard, which has Alps tactile switches. So they are not clicky, but they are tactile. And these keys are definitely stabilized. You can push them in the corners and they don't bind up or anything. In fact, none of the keys bind up. If you push them in the corners, it all works pretty well. And here's the label on the back, the MK105 from Mac Alley. And just like the Apple keyboard this is a clone of, it has ADB port there and another there. So one on each side. I want to do a quick test of the Mac Alley keyboard using the Mac Classic. Mac Classic 2, that is, it's the stealth one. I think I mentioned that every single time I break this computer out, but it looks like a Mac Classic on the outside, but it actually has a Mac Classic 2 motherboard on the inside. So the Mac Alley clone keyboard, that's yeah, a good match for this computer to be honest, a little retro bright. Look pretty good actually. And the cable that he included, let's just plug this in here. And the mouse that he sent connected to the keyboard. So I'll power on the machine. Hopefully it works. There's that chime. Let's go into keycaps here. Uh-oh, mouse is probably dirty inside. It's not moving around perfectly well. We're gonna run the Apple desktop accessory called keycaps. And it absolutely is seeing this keyboard as the extended keyboard clone that it is. And this just lets you quickly check that every key is working. This keyboard seems to have, like the Apple one, really two key rollover. Some combinations work with three. You see one, two, three works, but four, three, and two does not work. It does not register the two or the one. At a minimum, a keyboard really needs at least two key rollover, but I do have to say when you only have two key, there can be instances when you're typing really quickly where it's gonna lose key presses. And that's because as you get used to keyboards that have more than two key rollover, you end up holding down more than one key at a time when you're typing really quickly because the keyboards normally these days have no trouble handling that. But it can be problematic with certain key combinations on these older ones. Like in this case, it's actually registering six keys. So it really just depends on the way the matrix is made. So right now it's, I'm pushing down six keys and it's only registering two. And right now I'm pushing down six keys and it's actually registering none. If you're looking for a Macintosh ADB keyboard and you don't wanna pay the outrageous prices of the Apple extended keyboards when you look on eBay or whatnot, these Mac Alley keyboards aren't half bad. And if you can get one for a nice cheap price, it's a way to give your classic Macintosh or the 2GS a nice extended keyboard layout, which will be much more similar to a keyboard of today where your keys are in the positions you expect them to be like page up, page down, the escape key over here, normal inverted T for the arrow keys, stuff like that. Of course, on a Mac, like the NumLock key does not work as it does on a PC. And of course on a 2GS, I'm not even quite sure what half of these extended keyboard keys are gonna do. Like these page up, page down on 2GS probably does nothing. 
But nonetheless, not a bad keyboard if you are just looking for something that's inexpensive. Build quality is pretty good. It's definitely solid. And other than the rubber dome-ness of it, that doesn't feel quite as good. I'd say this keyboard's quite nice. As for the mouse here, well, it wasn't working very well and ball mice are just terrible. And ideally you just need to clean the ball with soap and water. Notice it's got a little bit of a shiny, glossy texture to it. You know, the scrubbing with this scotch Bright pad has a good effect of taking a lot of that off, which makes it grip the rollers inside the mouse here a lot better. And I'm back from the sink. I took soapy water and the back of a sponge. It's like a blue color scotch pad. And look at that, no more shininess. Let's pop this in the mouse. Hopefully this should grip a little bit better. Oh, I should check the rollers. Uh, the rollers actually look clean. They are not dirty in here. So it probably was just slipping on the table of all things. All right, there it is. Oh yeah, well, I mean, we're talking, it's, okay, let's close the keycaps there. Look how slowly it redraws everything. This absolutely works well now. Nice grippiness, no more slipping. So if you have a ball mouse, that's my top tip. Use soap, use warm water, and use the scrub pad on the back of your sponge to scrub away that shininess on the ball to rejuvenate it and make it work a whole lot better. And then we have this keyboard, which is an XT layout PC keyboard. And it has the standard five pins in. And the layout is very much like the IBM Model F, nothing specific. Has a pretty nice feel, and it is linear switches of some kind. And I wouldn't be surprised if I pop off one of the keycaps that I find Alps black switches, or maybe Cherry MX black, which I think are both linear switches. Because yeah, this feels pretty nice. I prefer tactile personally over linear, but let's just pop one of the keys off, see what we find. And there we go. Yes, I'd say that that is an MX mount and a black key switch. So I'd say that's probably a Cherry MX black. I really don't know if this is coming across in the camera, but there is a Cherry logo right on the top part of the switch body. So it's absolutely a Cherry, a genuine Cherry switch. Now, fortunately, as you can see, the keycaps are clearly ABS have yellowed super badly. In fact, the whole keyboard has yellowed kind of badly. So that's not great. Obviously there would have been some kind of branding here in this corner. That sticker is gone or it was never applied. It does have key switch lights and that's an upgrade over the Model F. There is still plastic on here that was never peeled off. There it comes. Oh yeah, peel that plastic. <laughs> If we flip the keyboard over on the bottom, it's actually a metal base. So this thing's rather chunky. And there we go. We see it's a Unitech keyboard for PCXTs, Da Yang Industry from Taiwan. And here we go. Exclusive Canadian distributor, Budgetron importer in Mississauga, Ontario. Warranty void if label removed. Someone has removed the label. <laughs> I wonder why. There are tilting feet on here, and as you can see, they are actually metal with a little kind of rubber thing, which is hardened. Just wanna to try to get rid of this bag. You know, bags on keyboard cords, it's something that these companies, they always did. And I always found it really hard to get off. Okay, that one wasn't too bad. Could have been worse, but sometimes the tape would be wrapped around really tightly and you couldn't get in there because of the coil cord and the whole thing was annoying and frustrating. So, yeah. Off camera, I tested this on my Compact Desk Pro, which speaks XT, and the keyboard works absolutely perfectly. Every single key registers without any issue, and since it's an XT class computer, completely works. So Adam, thank you very much for sending me this Cherry MX Black metal battle axe of a keyboard here for the XT, and this clone Mac Alley keyboard and mouse for the Macintosh, of course and that wonderful Canadian candy. And with that, that's the end of this mail call video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what to do. And now you can support the channel on Patreon. There'll be a link in the description below if you wanna do that and subscribe and all that YouTube -y stuff if you want to. And that's gonna be it. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.